Okay. Um, so living life and loving it. I mean, pretty much we've been here today and learning so much, and that's part of living life, really, and knowing all your limits and learning as much as you can. Um, so I'm going to start by just giving you a bit about inspiration, and then I'll tell you a bit about my story and pretty much my life and a snapshot of what I've been up to in the last 45, uh, 50 years. Okay, so my goals and dreams may not be your goals and dreams, but I can pretty much assure you that you live your life in FOMO. Well, FOMO is fear of missing out. Um, if there is one thing I've learned about FOMO, it's that you may miss out on the goals that you want, but they'll always come round again. So if you're meant to do them, you'll have another chance. <laughs> My first major dream was to fly to England. Um, and that was brought on because we had new neighbours in our street and the boy of the family was my age and we went to the same school. And I pretty much lived at their place because everything about him fascinated me. His, he had cool toys, books, games, clothes, and his accent was just so cool. <laughs> <laughs> so before I take you on my little jet-setting tour around the world, I'll start from the beginning. I'm the youngest of five. Um, I have four sisters and one brother. And I was the only child that was planned because I was supposed to be a playmate for my brother. And I was going to be called Michael. So that didn't vary too much. Um, when I was born, I was a healthy eight pound something. And I um, was fine uh, for the first week of my life. And then when I was um, going home, that's when I started having what mum and dad called having fits. I was a blue baby and I had club fingers and I'd have these fits and they would just be frantically running me to the doctors. To, for, this went on for seven months before doctors could actually find out what was wrong. They knew I was a blue baby, but they didn't know what exactly was the function of my heart. So. Seven months time came and I've been doing a lot of trips to Green Lane as well as my local doctor. And um, they decided that yes, they could try and do this new pioneer surgery called Fontan. So at 11 months old, I was one of the few that got this done in 1968. Um, and it was done by Sir Brian Barrett Boyce and his team. So, um, uh, the, and of course it was successful. My parents were told that I would have a five-year lifespan. And the, the three things that happened when I was in hospital at that time, um, my eldest sister and my brother and myself were all having heart surgery at the same time. My brother and sister were mainly a bronchial kind of thing, but mine was more serious. But in those days they did the surgery, not just a nice little scar down the side, it was cut you in half round the back. So we've all got great um, war stories there. <laughs> um, the other thing was that my brother and sister never had to have any other surgery, so that was fine. And um, yeah, just basically I was sent home to get on with my life and just see how I would go. So um, I, my, my, I, I recall it, my life has been pretty, pretty normal. You know, I... Um, I played normal, I lived normal, I had absolutely no time for girly things or dresses. Um, I was supposed to be the boy I, you know, that was planned and I, I was the tomboy. Shorts and t-shirt, bare feet, running around with a snotty nose, I ate dirt, dug holes, um, just, yeah, all sorts of things. Burnt, mag, uh, burnt ants with magnifying glasses and, <laughs> um, yeah. Learned to swim in the sea and had imaginary friends, made mud pies, you name it. I did boy things and um, mostly tried to keep up with my brother. My two favourite games were playing war and swimming. Now swimming was pretty... Um, I always thought that if I had to get out of the pool my friends would leave, but I didn't realise for years later that they actually just wanted the pool. They didn't really want me there, so... <laughs> um, but playing war was was um, really good because my brother made a replica, a life-size replica of a rifle 
made out of wood and steel pole, and he put a piece of carpet over it so I could, I could carry it over my shoulder. But he made it for himself, but I took hold of it, and it was a, pretty much the same size as me. So I'd run around the neighbourhood playing more, because we, we were the biggest family in the street. Everyone used to come to our place. And if I got too tired, I'd just lie down and play dead, and all the people would just <laughs> run past me. <laughs> Um, I just need to go to the next. So when I went to school, um, mostly I had days like this. It was pretty good. But there was times, and I hear stories sort of about it now where teachers used to make you run just because, in my day, it was just because they wanted to pretty much. They, they knew I had heart problems way before I learned about, about myself. So, you know, with my tongue hanging out like this on this picture, that's just how I feel because they just keep saying, keep going, Michelle, keep going. And I just want to stop and pretty much die. <laughs> and the crying, I'm, I would never really understood fatigue all that time ago, but it was, there was a lot of fatigue and a lot of just didn't want to go to school and I have no idea why, just wanted to stay home and sleep. <laughs> Um, and of course, going with with this time at school age and stuff, it was also I remember a lot of appointments going to Green Lane, and um, how times have changed. If you've ever been to appointments at Green Lane, but now Auckland Hospital, of course, um, we used to sit in a long dark corridor where people would just their knees would touch like this. That's how narrow the corridor was. Um, the doctors to get from there from calling you in the waiting room to the consultant room, they had to literally climb over your knees to get down the hallway. Um, there was no toys, no books, no TV, not very much talking, and people used to be able to smoke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but ch times have changed now. As you all know, the doctors will come to you and the appointments aren't very long at all. Ours, mine used to take a day to get from Rotorua to Auckland and I'd have to stay overnight because I'd be t so tired and we'd drive back the next day. So yeah. But anyway, that's pretty much... Oh, I also had other surgery, sorry. Um, when I was 13, I had a tricuspid <coughs> valve replacement. Oh, I forgot to tell you what I was born with. Didn't I? Oh. Um, I'll just tell you. Uh, I had... Um, uh, what did I have? Oh, oh, yeah, my right heart pretty much didn't work. It was out of action. So I had a Bjork... Fontan and a Waterston shunt, which was like a bridge over the aorta and pulmonary valves, I think. Yeah. So when I was 13, I had tricuspid valve replacement, and when I was 32, I had a um, a conversion, Fontan conversion, and a pacemaker. Right. Um, but anyway, it didn't really stop me doing what I planned to do. So I'll just get on with you jet setting around the world. Okay, my, my first goal, as I said before, was to wanting to go to England. So this was my first white Christmas. <laughs> Travelled around with some friends um, from New Zealand, because I actually flew to, New Zealand by, uh, flew to England by myself. First time I'd ever been on a, a plane overseas, but none of my friends were ready to go, so I just said, well, I can't wait for you. <laughs> Um, what else? Oh, I'll just, I think, yeah. When I came back to New Zealand, I decided that my next ambition was to go to India. So, um, once again, went there, no, just by myself, never been there before either, and um, had a great time. I, I'm absolutely a fan of the Dalai Lama, so I just wanted to meet him face to face, which I did. I mean, he didn't know me, and I didn't know him, but, you know, we just were this close. <laughs> um, yeah, there's just some more pictures. I went, these, where the, where the Tibetan flags are, I went to, um, my aim was to, to go to India and teach English to Tibetan monks. And I was only there two days, and one monk came up to me at the Dalai Lama temple and asked me how long I would be there for. I said, oh, I'm here for about six weeks. So he said, well, can you meet me at the temple and at two o'clock this afternoon and teach me English? So he brought me along this um, book on grammar, which was all American grammar, and we just, oh, 
I don't know how I even made sense to him about it all, but thank God there was lots of pictures in the book. <laughs> um, and he was my first student. So we used to do classes at the temple just one-on-one. -on -one. But from there, um, I went and I taught at other schools, just, just learning, in, uh, just conversation English, because I'm not a teacher at all. And um, these were the two of my classroom, two of the classes that I taught, and this is the party that they gave me at the end of my um, three months that I was there with them when I visited India the second time. And each of these students who were um, cheering with their glasses, they are all great singers, so they all sang me a song. And oh, it was just really, really wonderful. <laughs> um, and one, this is, to, this is um, Sam Dup. He is now our monk son. Um, because we couldn't have kids, we just decided that we'd um, adopt, well, be a surrogate parents to a monk. <laughs> um, and when I first met him, I taught him English, and he came to me with a Famous Five book. And if you know how detailed the Famous Five books are, he was insistent on reading me a whole chapter, his first lesson. He was so determined to learn English. But now he gives us cheek, and his English is fine. He's learn, learning other languages. He lives in Amsterdam now, and we're hoping to go and visit him. But this is his country, Tibet, and I had the privilege of going, to, going there with high altitude. And um, out of the group that I went with, I was the only one that didn't have any effects until I got home. So that was really good. <laughs> um, and USA and Canada, I've been to... to these countries quite a bit. This, um, this is another high altitude place. I think this is the highest I've been. Um, it's the summit on Pikes Peak in Colorado. Yeah. And, um, oh, how do you go back? Okay. Um, I'm not really sure. I keep an eye on the time, sorry. Um, so I've got, in a nutshell, I have about six tips for just living your life to the full, really. Um, my first one is, no one knows you better than yourself, so learn to understand your limits. Um, don't, get too up, don't get too hung up on the medical details, because that's the doctor's job. <laughs> Remember that doctors are extremely interested in what, you're, what you've been doing, so share your stories whenever you get to your appointments. And that's a good excuse to get to your appointments. <laughs> Um, it's okay to rest. It's definitely to, okay to tell your friends that you need a rest. And your true friends will walk by your side your whole, your whole journey. They'll understand you. Um, learn to laugh at yourself. There are so many people that are far worse than you. And I learned that a lot when I had the Tibetan students to teach because their life, I mean, I've just got a heart condition, but they haven't, they've got, they haven't got a life really, they're just in limbo and they're far worse than me. Um, and who cares how big or small your goals are, or your goals or dreams are, because they're your goals and dreams, so it doesn't really matter. And the last one is be proud of everything that has happened to you. Oh, yeah, be proud of everything that's happened to you. <laughs> um, my, my husband is also a, a petrol head, a bit like what I've discovered I've, I've been like since being a tomboy. So in a few weeks' time, we're going to America again to um, look at our friends who do drag racing and also watch the, I don't really know what they're called, those rocket things that go on the salt flats, the top picture there. That's like um, the equivalent to, um, what's his name, Burt Munro? Yeah, but it's a bit more modern looking. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, yeah, that's pretty much my story. It's just a snapshot of my life, but just your goals are not, may not be travelling. Your goals might just be to walk to the letterbox or walk to the end of the street by the end of the week. But whatever they are, they're your goals. So just live your life 